the apocalypse of Zerubbabel, the important task he achieved that was prophesied and the direction of history that took place. And uh, we were directed to this because of the Book of Enoch, that uh, the video I posted yesterday concerning Enoch and after his uh, assumption to heaven, to paradise near God. Uh, there are those who believe that he was Metatron and also the Archangel Michael. I don't know how uh, real that or true that is because I know that the Archangels especially were around at the fall of the fallen angels uh, before humanity, before uh, God created man. The angels, some angels were very angry that man created by God would be elevated to the level of angels. So uh, this is where we are now. The Apocalypse of Zerubbabel, according to Wikipedia. Sefer Zerubbabel, also called the Book of Zerubbabel or the Apocalypse of Zerubbabel, is a medieval Hebrew apocalypse written at the beginning of the 7th century AD in the style of biblical visions, for example, Daniel and Ezekiel, placed into the mouth of Zerubbabel, the last descendant of the Davidic line, to uh, take a prominent part in Israel's history, who laid the foundation of the Second Temple in the 6th century BC. The Davidic line is the house of David, referring to the lineage of King David, through the text of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. We know that Joseph, the uh, betrothed of Mary, was of the Davidic line. That's why he had to go to the census with Mary uh, when she was pregnant. Uh, before she gave birth to our Lord Jesus Christ. Mary was also of the house of David. So he was also, Zerubbabel was also of the Davidic line. He had to lay the foundation of the second temple in the 6th century BC. The enigmatic post-exilitic biblical leader receives a revolutionary vision outside, out, outlining the personalities and events associated with the restoration of Israel, the end days, and the establishment of the Third Temple. Finally, support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily, and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support, and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below. And here is a, an old painting of Zero Babel showing the plans to the king of uh, Persia, King Maid King Cyrus. Now, uh, in the history, the groundwork for the book, probably written in Palestine between 629 and 636, during fierce struggles between Persia and the Byzantine Empire for control of the Holy Land. These wars touched Byzantine Palestine and stirred messianic hopes among the Jews, including the author for whom the uh, wars appeared to be eschatological events leading to the appearance of the Messiah. Now, Sefer Zerubbabel is extant in a number of manuscripts and print recessions. That may be the oldest manuscript copy is part of the prayer book reportedly dated at about 840 AD. And the first publication was in 1519 in Constantinople, today's Istanbul, with an anthology called Likitem Shonim. Now, because the book gave an unequivocal date of 1058 AD for the return of the Messiah, it exerted great influence upon contemporary messianic thought, thought and the book is mentioned by Eliezer of Worms and supposedly by Rashi, Abraham Ibn Ezra, criticizing the book as unreliable. The contents, Sefer describes the eschatological struggle between the Antichrist Armilus, who is the leader of Rome and Christianity, and the Messiah Ben Joseph, who fails in battle but paves the way for the Davidic Messiah, and the ultimate triumph of righteousness. The original author expected the Messiah would come in the immediate future. Subsequent editions, of course, substituted later dates. Now, set after Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of Jerusalem, the book begins with Zerubbabel, whose name was associated with the First Restoration, receiving a vision after praying for knowledge of the form of, eternal, of the Eternal House. In the vision, he's transported by the angel Metatron 
to Nineveh. Metatron, as we said before, is the angel in Judaism mentioned three times in the Bavil. Uh, we believe that he was uh, the Enoch of the line of Seth that was taken up alive uh, to God. So, and uh, the video before this one, we talked about Metatron. Some believe he was actually the angel, Archangel Michael. So he was taken to Nineveh, the ancient Assyrian city of Upper Mesopotamia, located on the outskirts of Mosul in modern-day northern Iraq. Nineveh is also associated with the prophet Jonah, who gave a prophecy that God would destroy the city, but uh, they listened to his prophecy, and everyone, even the animals, fasted and prayed for three days, and God relented. So, uh, the in, the vision, in the vision, he was transported by the angel Metatron to Nineveh, the city of blood representing Rome. By, this is all symbolic, of course, by which the author likely means Byzantium. There he finds the marketplace, a bruised and despised man named Menahem ben Amiel, who leaves, leave, reveals himself to be the Messiah, Messiah ben David, doomed to abide there until his appointed hour. Zerubbabel asks when the lamp of Israel would be kindled. Metatron interjects that the Messiah would return 990 years after the destruction of the temple, that is about 1058 AD. So, that, of course, that uh, came and went, that date. Now, the uh, other Zerubbabel, Wikipedia again. Zerubbabel, according to biblical uh, narrative, was the governor of Achaemenid Empire province Yehud Medinata, the grandson of Joachim, penultimate king of Judah. Zerubbabel led the first group of Jews, numbering 42,360, who returned from the Babylonian captivity in the first year of Cyrus the Great, commonly known as Cyrus the Great, called Cyrus the Elder by the Greeks, was the founder of the Achaemenid Empire, the first Persian Empire. Uh, the date is generally thought to have been around 538 to 520 BC. Zerubbabel also laid the foundation for the Second Temple in Jerusalem soon after. In all of the accounts in the Hebrew Bible that mention Zerubbabel, he's always associated with the high priests who returned with him. Yeshua, the high priest, was actually Jesus. His name was Jesus, Yeshua. Uh, Joshua, Yeshua, son of Josadak. Together, these two men led the first wave of the Jewish returnees from exile from Babylon and began to rebuild the temple. The, that's the second temple. The first temple was built by Solomon and destroyed when uh, the Babylonians captured uh, 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 Israel and Judah and uh, there was the exile towards Babylon. Now, the Old Testament theologian John Kessler describes the region of Judah as a small province that contained land extending 25 kilometers from Jer Jerusalem and was independently ruled prior to the Persian rule. And Zerubbabel was the governor of the province. King Darius of Persia appointed Zerubbabel governor of the province. It was after his appointment that Zerubbabel began to rebuild the temple. Elias Bickerman speculates that one of the reasons that Zerubbabel was able to rebuild the temple was because of, quote, the widespread revolts at the beginning of the reign of Darius I in 522 BC, which preoccupied him to such a degree that Zerubbabel felt he could initiate the rebuilding of the temple without repercussions, end quote. As mentioned before, Zerubbabel was of the Davidic line from Jeconiah and had been uh, cursed by Jeremiah, saying that that's what happened with the Davidic line, saying that no offspring of Coniah would sit on the throne, Jeremiah 22.30, Zerubbabel was of the main divinic line through Solomon and Jeconiah. The prophets Zechariah and Haggai both give unclear statements regarding Zerubbabel's authority in their oracles, in which Zerubbabel was either the subject of a false prophecy or the receiver of a divine promotion to kingship. He could also be viewed as a governor of a state within another nation and thus technically not on the throne of the nation. Either way, he was given the task of rebuilding the second temple 
In the second year of the reign of Darius, 520 BC, along with the high priest Joshua, Jesus Joshua, uh, son of Jehozadak. Now, Shez Bazar, the book of Ezra, begins with Cyrus the Great entrusting the temple vessels to Shez Bazar, prince of Judah, probably from Akkadian. Uh, this apparently important figure disappears from story entirely after being named in Ezra for some odd reason. Ezra 1.8 and Ezra 5.14. And uh, Zerubbabel is abruptly introduced as the main figure. Both are called governors of Judah and both credited with laying the foundation of the temple. A number of explanations have been proposed, including one, the two are the same person, and two, Shez Bazar is in fact Shez Nazar, Akkadian, Zerubbabel's uncle, mentioned in the book of Chronicles. And three, Shez Bazar began the work and Zerubbabel finished the work. In the Hebrew Bible, in the prophets Nevi'im, Zerubbabel appears in the prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah. In the prophecy of Haggai, Haggai 2.23 says, On that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, and wear you like a signet ring, for it is you whom I have chosen. This is the word of the Lord of hosts. End quote. This quotation from the book of Haggai illustrates the messianic expectations that are often associated with Zerubbabel. The term, my servant, describes Zerubbabel as God's servant. This term is often associated with King David. Walter Rose concludes that the fact that the epithet servant is hardly ever used for kings after David may be related to the fact that most of them were disappointed in their performance as kings appointed by Yahweh. Rose emphasizes that the author of the book of Haggai is associating Zerubbabel with King David. Scholars have also analyzed the phrase, I will take you. Rose associates this term with a mission or change or protection. In other words, he's got an apostleship. For Zerubbabel, this mission was likely the rebuilding of the second temple. Let's keep in mind that every Christian is a part of the uh, temple of God or of Christ's body has a mission to do that nobody ever ever in the past or in the future will have. So don't think that you're not important in Christ's eyes you are. And uh, even if it's just staying home and praying um, or even if you're holding your temper back and speaking logically to a person instead of you know uh, being rude to them, uh, all these things are very important for Christ. And for a Christian. Uh, don't think that you, he's not using you. He is. Christ is using you for his glory and for his, for the salvation of mankind. Now, going back to this, the most widely debated part of this prophecy is the phrase, wear you like a singet ring. A singet ring is an authoritative symbol that is associated with power. You, kings used to wear rings. They used to seal. You know, they used to write things on a, on a paper and they used to pour a little bit of hot wax, and they used to put their sing, sing it ring on the hot wax, as that was their logo, you know. That was their uh, proof that they sent it, that, that they wrote the letter. Uh, on the, the sing it ring had made the impression on the wax. So the sing it ring is the authoritative symbol that is associated with power, and Rose interprets this passage by comparing it to the passage in Jeremiah 22-24, in through which he concludes that the king is a singet ring on God's hand. John Kessler interprets the idea of the nature of the singet ring as such that, quote, the real true figure of speech at issue is a personification of which the simile or metaphor is only a part. The real trope consists of the personification of Yahweh, God, who is likened to the owner of the singet ring. End quote. However, this word, when in Hebrew, has been translated as meaning both seal and singet ring. It's unclear whether Haggai's prophecy claims that Zerubbabel is going to be the king of the land of Judah, or if he's just to build the second temple, 
Many scholars interpreted the following passage from Haggai as identifying Zerubbabel as the king of the land of Judah and continuation of the divinic line. Quote, Zerubbabel is to be made either the representative of God or the new king who will restore the monarchy or the new world leader. One sometimes finds words like messianic or messiah used to describe Zerubbabel's role, end quote. According to Peter Ackroyd, Zerubbabel was a royal representative of God. Both historians' interpretations of the prophecy of Haggai appear to understand the term of the singet ring as being a metaphor for Zerubbabel's attaining God's authority on earth. Not all biblical scholars interpret Zerubbabel's authority in the same manner. Other scholars see it as a prophecy proclaiming that Zerubbabel will become king according to the Sarah Japhet. Haggai does not explain, though, for what Zerubbabel was chosen. From what is described in the prophecy, the overthrow of the kingdoms of the nations as the first stage in the choosing of Zerubbabel, we may conclude that Haggai sees Zerubbabel as a king whose kingdom is made possible by a change in the political structure. And from now on, since Zerubbabel has been chosen as a singet, he will be sitting on the throne of David while and ruling again in Judah, all this, however, is only hinted at in the prophecy of Haggai and not stated explicitly, end quote. John Kessler's interpretation agrees with Lemaire. Lemaire interprets the author of Haggai as wanting Jerubbabel to be appointed to a lesser role. Haggai is expressing the hope of a change in status of the province of Yehud and of Zerubbabel's emergence as the king of a vassal state within the Persian Empire, John Kessler interprets interpretation agrees with Lemaire's. The promise of David as now functioning in a new form, accommodating to the realities of Persian period, Zerubbabel was not the ruler of a nation, but the governor of a province. Yet such a provisional situation poses no inherent threat to the promise of the divinic house. Zechariah. Falling in line with the, the rest of the 12 prophetic books of the Hebrew Bible, the Nevi'im, the book of Zechariah describes the hopes of a future king beyond the current leader, Zerubbabel, and further establishes a, a portrayal of his future king. Anthony Peterson argues that the standard explanation of Haggai and Zechariah's prophecies, in which Zerubbabel was supposed to be the restorer of the divinic dynasty, but never fulfilled these expectations does not actually stand as an explanation of the final form of these texts. Zerubbabel's name is mentioned four times throughout Zechariah 1 to 8, and all of these instances occur in one short oracle written in chapter 4, and other references to Zerubbabel throughout the book are guesses or theories as to his significance. Zechariah 4, 1 to 3 gives a vision that was had by Zechariah of a lampstand with a bowl on it. Upon that are seven lamps, each with seven lips. There are two olive trees, meaning mercy. We have this uh, symbolism also in the uh, uh, book of Revelation of John. The last book of the New Testament has these or uh, lampstands and the uh, lampstand, the seven seven branch la uh, lamp, and the olive trees. Now, there are two olive trees, one on the right of the bowl, one on the left. The explanation told by an angel that Zechariah is conversing with is as follows. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. You might know, not by might or nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it, Zechariah 4, 67. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of his house. His hands shall also complete it. The seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. The two olive trees are the two sons of oil, anointed ones, who stand by the Lord of the whole earth, Zechariah 4, 9 to 14. There's a debate in the biblical scholarly community as to who the sons of oil is referring to, though conventional wisdom often understood it to be Zerubbabel and Joshua, the priest. Boda argues that because of the important role that prophets were said to play in the reconstruction of the temple in Zechariah 8-9, and, 
Haggai and Zechariah are the sons of oil. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Here is a man whose name is Branch, Hebrew Zema, for he shall branch out in his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear royal honor, and shall sit upon his throne and rule. There shall be a priest by his throne, with peaceful understanding between the two of them. Zechariah 6, 12-13. So it's unclear whether or not the branch refers to Zerubbabel. Should this have been the intention of the author, then the restoration of the divinic line of kings would be imminent, as Zerubbabel is a member of the divinic line, 1 Chronicles 3, 19-20. There is some evidence for this link, namely that Zerubbabel was the governor of Judah at the time of Zechariah. He was frequently associated with Joshua the priest as a uh, written in Ezra 3, 2, and 3, 8. And he's also described as the temple builder, Zechariah 4, 9. However, there are several reasons that complicate this association. The first is that Joshua, the priest, as we know, the high priest, is the one crowned, not the branch. The next is that Zerubbabel is not mentioned. The third is that the references to Zema appear to anticipate a future event, while Zerubbabel existed in the present. Zechariah neither proclaims that Zerubbabel will restore the monarchy, nor does he contradict the previous hopes for a divinic line, Haggai 2.23. Rather, Zechariah maintains hope for a divinic king in the future without tying down the prophecy directly to Zerubbabel. Nehemiah, the reference to Zerubbabel in the book of Nehemiah is rather brief. The author of the book of Nehemiah only refers to Zerubbabel in passing when the author states that, quote, These are the priests and the Levites which came back with Zerubbabel, sons of Shealtiel, and with Joshua, Nehemiah 12.1. The book of Nehemiah provides no new information regarding uh, Zerubbabel. However, Nehemiah seems to have replaced Zerubbabel as governor. In the New Testament, the name Zerubbabel appears in both versions in the genealogy of Jesus. In Matthew's genealogy from Solomon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtel, and Shealtel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, Matthew 1, 12-13. In Luke's genealogy, Luke was a doctor, he was the doctor also who took care of the Apostle Paul, and he was Greek. Uh, now, in Luke's, Luke had the biological Physiological, physiological genealogy from the line of Mary, whereas Matthew had the line of uh, uh, Mary's betrothed uh, Joseph, although our Lord Jesus Christ didn't have any, any physical, biological line from Joseph. Now, in Luke's genealogy from Nathan, son of David, there is also Zerubbabel, son of Shalatiel, different spelling from Matthew, Shalatiel, but this Zerubbabel is grandson of Neri, not Jeconiah, and his son is Re or Rehesha and not Abiud, Luke 3.27. So these genealogies do not match the genealogy mentioned in 1 Chronicles. Various explanations have been suggested. So uh, there's uh, a lot to be said about all these prophecies. Um, Zerubbabel in... Uh, in, uh, and Darius contest in other texts, in Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Nicholas Bozen, 1320, uh, John Goer, 1390, Lope de Vega, 1638, Mary Collier, The Three Wise Sentences, 1730, various uh, theological statements concerning this. Okay, so... Uh, Zerubbabel, the second temple, we went off on a tangent for this just to know that he was behind it because of the prophecy of the return of uh, Israel to uh, the promised land. This is on Wikipedia. I'll leave links below for you for this. Thank you for your support and please leave your comments. Thank you.